I'm a renal registrar. I'm also a research fellow uh, presenting a typical case of progressive CKD today. All right. So I'm starting with two slides, very quick information, which I think is very relevant to CKD. So hopefully most of you will know the CKD has five stages of CKD. But the most important thing is not EGFR alone is not enough to stage CKD. We have to do proteinuria tests, usually ACR, so an albuminic creatinine ratio. And you can see the color-coded prognosis is very different in the same stage of uh, according to EGFR, but it's different if we add on the proteinuria in the equation. So do ACR for all patients uh, with CKD to, act, uh, to accurately stage them. That's the first and second thing before I do the case is most patients with CKD, they don't show symptoms. So you can't spot uh, a patient because of symptoms to have CKD. So we should focus really on identifying people who have high risk of CKD, um, of course, diabetes, hypertension, and people with family history of CKD, they have to have screen to check if they have CKD or not. Some patients may have uh, symptoms from complication from CKD, like anemia and chronic artery disease. Okay, now is the case. So we have a 73-year-old, this is a real case from one of our clinics, the 73-year-old male retired plumber, uh, was referred by his GP to our services in 2020. And the reason for his, for referral was a decline in kidney function, was a progressive one. EGFR went from 50 to 31 over five years. So there's around four mils per minute per year loss of EGFR. And the ACR was 62. So that's the highest category of ACR. So he was seen in the, our cardiac uh, diabetic clinic, which is a specialist multimorbidity clinic we have at Salford. Um, the background is of type 2 diabetes for 10 years, ischemic heart disease. We have a very high BMI of 40.6. He's an excess smoker, which adds to the, um, to the cardiovascular risk, COPD, arthritis, and also hypothyroidism. Um, the patient was on these medications when he presented to us. He was on pioglitazone, which is an antidiabetic medication, lisinopril, aspirin, statin, and ivabradin for the heart. Um, history was showing some exertional breathlessness, which is likely from his COPD, also pain in his knee from the arthritis. Examination showed a high BP, 158 over 80. Uh, there's a urine dip showed protein leak and the chest was clear with some edema in his legs. Uh, investigation was EGFR was 41. Uh, the protein keratin ratio was 100. Albumin was normal, 42. HB is good, but iron sats were low. And the immunology screen, which we do usually for patient presenting to us, just to rule out uh, immunology if we don't have a, like a strong um, apparent uh, cause of CKD, we do screen, uh, which consists of connective tissue disease, um, uh, immunology, including also myeloma screen and anchor test, etc. Uh, they were all negative. Um, so how did we manage this patient from 2020 and still ongoing now? So there are uh, three points I think I will make. So the first point is optimizing blood pressure. This is very important because we know higher BP will make uh, CKD progress faster. And the target for this patient is below 130 over 80. So what we did, we increased the lisinopril dose to 20 milligrams um, to uh, optimize blood pressure. However, uh, but that made potassium to go up to six uh, that required a and &E, uh, admission but that's now under control with Lokelma, which is a potassium binder we use now. Uh, we give these medications more and more now to allow people to be on the right medication, such as lisinopril. Um, also, the second point is we try to introduce cardiorenal protective medicines. Uh, and Professor Kalra will talk to you more about this. So first thing that we tried is uh, giving the patient SGLT2 inhibitors, dapagliflozin, which was given to the patient. And also we tried GLP-1 agonist, uh, such as semaglutide and the dulaglutide. Uh, that one was tried by the GP, but unfortunately resulted in severe diarrhea. And the patient didn't want to try another uh, medicine in the same family. Um, so, 
you can see the graph here of the EGFR and that's from 2015, then 2020, then 2024 at the end. Um, so basically, this is the first period here you can see in red. This is the period before the referral to us. OK, so this is what's with under the GP, which was, um, as we said, declined by around 12 EGFR, 4 mils per minute per year. And then we saw the patient in 2020 and over one year, we tried to introduce these medications, optimize blood pressure, so dapagliflozin, increase dose of lisinopril. Um, so that made the EGFR started to, so at the end of 2021, and the rest for the last three years, you can see GFR stabilized between 30 and 28. So after introducing all these medications, the EGFR is not declining anymore um, and it stayed the same for around three years, which is a great thing because of the medications and blood pressure optimization. Um, the patient, these are latest results from September, I think uh, beginning of this month. He visited the clinic, blood pressure is really well optimized, 115 over 78 as we want it. EGFR stabilized 28 for the last three years. Hemoglobin is okay, and the PCR has improved from 100 to 70. Uh, BMI remains high. Uh, this is definitely room for improvement. We tried to do uh, um, usual stuff like exercise and diet, but it's not really helping the patient, unfortunately. Also tried GLP-1, if you remember, and uh, resulted in diarrhea. So that could reduce the, the BMI further. Um, so this is a room of improvement here for BMI to reduce cardiovascular risk for this patient, of course, and progression of his CKD. And that's me. Over to you, Professor. Oh, that's good. OK, so say thank you very much indeed. So um, here we go with uh, my presentation. Join you just need to click on it. Can I just take that off as well? Yeah, the camera on the screen. Yeah, good. Sorry about this team. OK, thank you very much indeed. So here we are. So actually, the picture on the left is what this hospital looked like when I first came here. Really, <laughs> back in the, the late 1980s, I came as a registrar. But obviously, we've come a long way. And let's hope we have in the management of CKD as well. So just some basics for all of you. Thanks very much for attending, by the way. And I should mention a couple of things at the start. Thank you to Joanne. Um, who is from AstraZeneca. She's kindly sponsoring the food and um, and drink for you today. We're really kind of you, so thanks very much. Uh, you'll be getting a, a mention a bit later on. And uh, secondly, we are recording this, so people who uh, aren't able to stay for it at all and other people later will be able to get a podcast of this, I hope, and, and uh, other meetings as we go forward. So just some basics, main functions of the kidney. I like to look at this in sort of terms of five. Number one, clearance of waste. That's the GFR filtration, getting rid of waste that we build up every day. Electrolyte balance, particularly potassium being regulated very tightly. Also sodium, pH balance, so acid base, um, maintaining your pH tightly, 7.35 to 4 finally with um, excretion of acid into the distal tubule, but also reabsorption of bicarbonate in the proximal tubule, really important. Fluid balance, we drink 10 litres of water, we pass 9 litres of urine, um, obviously we've got a, a regulatory mechanism there. And then the fifth one is endocrine functions, which is ABC, renin angiotensin aldosterone axis, I'll tell you more about that later, EPO secretion by the kidney, we our kidney patients get anemic without that, and then um, vitamin D metabolism too. Um, a few nice little pictures about the kidneys, okay, we should have two, um, one in 200 people don't, unfortunately, but anyway, um, and at the age of, you know, most of you at your peak age, 25 to 30, uh, we've got about a million glomeruli in each kidney, um, and uh, you know, they're responsible for the filtration. You can see the ball of capillaries there. Some fascinating facts, I think. So uh, length 8 to 13 centimetres, weight 160 grams. The combined weight of the two kidneys, therefore, is one two hundredth of our body weight. And yet 
they have one quarter to one fifth of our blood supply. So just think about that. One two hundredth of the body weight and yet a quarter of the blood supply. So there are very, very vascular organs uh, which are leading to filtration. And you can see here's a, a, an ultrastructural capillary loop. Um, and you can see the podocyte, which is this fancy cell on the outside. Um, um, you know, people, people are really excited about this. It's, it has slit membranes and maintains the filtration barrier, but does lots of other functions. We even have podocytologists as a, uh, you know, in, in the world now researching this area as well. So what else do I want to tell you about the, the functions of the kidney? Well, you can see the proximal tubule um, is a major site for reabsorption. This is where all of the energy is consumed in the kidney. Hence, if you get an ischemic injury with poor blood supply, as in acute kidney injury, often we get necrosis of this area, acute tubular necrosis, uh, because that's where the, the energy is being consumed. Sodium is reabsorbed there, about 50% of it, 30% in the, in the ascending loop of Henle, and then 10% in the distal tubule, and then a couple of percent more in the collecting tubule under the influence of um, aldosterone. Now, CKD is common. So we recognise in the UK that there are at least three and a half million people with CKD. And we reckon that there's another million who are not yet recognised. So by 2030, you know, we, we're thinking there could be four and a half million people. And we're talking, therefore, in terms of adult people, we're looking at about a, an eight to 10 percent prevalence of CKD. Uh, so it's a really common condition. Causes of progressive CKD. Now, uh, this is progressive means these are the people that are going to end up on dialysis or need transplantation. We're looking at 20% due to diabetic kidney disease, 15% hypertension or renal vascular disease, one or other. Glomerulonephritis, a chronic glomerulonephritis, an inflammatory condition of the kidneys, 8% due to reflux or scarring of the kidneys, pyelonephritis, 6% polycystic kidney disease or other familial disease, and then these other conditions. We have many cases where we don't know what the cause is. They just present with small kidneys, and we, we've got, we haven't biopsied them. There, It would be not safe, and besides, we wouldn't get any information from it. So just to give you a parallel, in the United States, 40% of their dialysis program is diabetic, and if you go to the Far East, um, there's an even higher prevalence of uh, diabetic kidney disease. Here's some pictures. Uh, renal vascular disease, so this is where you've got narrowing of the renal arteries. You can see that there nicely, a really atrophic kidney with a vessel that's full of atheroma there. Um, polycystic kidney disease, this is a one foot ruler, 30 centimetres. Remember the kidneys are 8 to 13. This kidney is about 40 centimetres long. I said it's 160 grams. This one weighed 10 kilograms. So the patient had two of them, 20 kilograms. So, and, and then glomerulonephritis. So this is a normal glomerulus shown again. That's called the Bowman space. Um, this is where the little blood vessels are, the afferent and efferent arterial. And here's a, a condition called membranous glomerulonephritis. You can see the difference. Now, one important point and safe um, mentioned in that patient, proteinuria and the importance of proteinuria. Now, um, we really are now emphasizing more and more, especially in primary care, the importance of testing urinary albumin to creatinine ratio. And I'm going to just explain this in a bit more detail in a, in a few minutes. But um, and, and it's really trying to emphasize to them with particularly with diabetic patients, of which there are millions in the UK, three million at least, if we wait until the GFR has dropped to 60 mils a minute, which is what starts to be under that is stage 3A CKD, um, then the patient will have lost almost three quarters of their functioning mass look. Um, so we don't want to wait that long. We want GPs to recognize that uh, someone has got kidney disease when the ACR, the albumin creatinine ratio, just goes abnormal, and that's above three milligrams per millimole. Okay, and at that point, then the patient would have only lost about 20 to 25 percent of the functioning nephrons. So we've got plenty of time to actually implement therapies that will slow their progression. Really important point. In terms of our goals of treatment in CKD, one is slowing 
or preventing nephropathy developing. So the case that um, SAI presented was a classic example. How do we get on top of that? Well, if it's a diabetic, glycemic control is really important. Blood pressure control is emphasised that. Control of proteinuria. Now, both of those are uh, looked after by renin angiotensin blockade. And by that, I mean ACE inhibitors, angiotensin receptor blockers, okay? And we use now the SGLT2 inhibitors, hence drugs like dapagliflozin, you'll hear more about. Um, and then we've got to improve the quality of life, and we do this with lifestyle change. That patient you heard had a BNI of 40. They need to lose weight. They need to take some exercise. They've got to change their diet, get fitter, because they'll live longer. And we can also do something about anemia management. Remember I said EPO is one of the things that the kidneys secrete. Um, we can we can do something about that as well and improve their quality of life. And then to improve survival, it's all of the above. Plus, we give statins to most of our CKD patients as well now because they have a high CKD risk. In terms of targets for treatment, diabetic um, glycemic control, you should be looking at an HbA1c of less than 55. That's about 8% in old money. You want to improve that blood pressure, 130 over 80 or less. Now, let's tell you a little bit about proteinuria, because um, this will be useful for all of you, really. So um, we remember these things, ACR and PCR, which we use in the hospital. You'll see them on all the, you know, the electronic patient records of the patients. These are protein-creatinine ratios or albumin-creatinine ratios, and that corrects for dilution. So one fact, we all pass just about 10 millimoles of creatinine a day. So the figure you get on an ACR, say your ACR is five, that is times it by 10, that gives you how much of that albumin you're passing per day. So it's 50 milligrams a day. So if we've got someone who's got a PCR of 100, times it by 10, they're passing 1,000 milligrams a day, one gram, which is a lot. So normal ACR, I've told you, is less than three. And normal PCR is less than 20 thereabouts. Um, and just another fact is that if, you, if you're if you using both tests, uh, you'll find that a diabetic, say with a PCR of 100, has got an ACR of 70. So typically, a diabetic, will, their albumin would be 70% of all the total protein. Okay, so important facts, and that should help you in your interpretation of uh, PCR and ACR. Hemoglobin targets, 120 grams per litre is what we um, have a ceiling on if we're using erythropoietin, so the EPOs that we give some of our patients. If they're not on EPO, they can have whatever the hemoglobin can be pushed up to, basically. Cholesterol, we important because of cardiovascular risk. Obesity, we try and reduce to the BMI to under 30, and then aerobic exercise. Now, for the last 20 years, until 2021, we've relied heavily upon ACE inhibitors and ARBs as almost like the, the mainstay of treatment of all CKD uh, to try and control blood pressure, reduce proteinuria. There's been a development, but uh, let me just show you why we have relied upon ACE inhibitors. So I've got this little kit to demonstrate it to you. Here's your kidney. The, remember, we've got a million of these in each kidney, the glomeruli. But let's say we've got a GFR of just 30, so we lose two-thirds of them. Watch. So there they go. What actually happens? Well, there's your glomerulus, look, with the afferent arteriole in the efferent out, and then this capillary loop in the middle of it. So if you put a, a garden, uh, like a garden hose pipe, and put a clamp on there, there'd be higher pressure in here, okay? Remember that. So with this dynamic <laughs> glomeruli, we get release of renin. I don't know if you can see that. Sorry about the corruption there, but we release this um, hormone called renin. What does renin do? It converts angiotensinogen to angiotensin 1, which isn't biologically active, but angiotensin 1 goes to the lung and under the influence of the ACE enzyme, angiotensin converting enzyme, we convert it to angiotensin 2, which is really uh, reactive. And you can see what it does. It constricts the efferent arteriole. What does that do? That leads to a much higher pressure in here called intraglomerular hypertension. And that is one of the mechanisms of CKD progression. And then what happens? Angiotensin 2 puts the systemic blood pressure up. It leads to the release of aldosterone from the zona glomerulosa of the adrenal glands, which further puts the blood pressure up. And together, these are two pro-fibrotic molecules. So they stimulate fibrosis in the kidneys and the heart. 
Now, what about proteinuria? Safe told you about that patient. So under normal circumstances, we get a, a dribble of proteinuria going through, easily dealt with by the renal tubular cells, not a problem. When we've got this high pressure in the glomeruli, we have um, a, a lot of proteinuria going through that can is absorbed by the proximal tubular cells and is leads to apoptosis, programmed cell death, and further is a mechanism contributing to CKD progression. How can we deal with this then? What have we got at our disposal? Well, we've got ACE inhibitors which block formation of angiotensin II, and then we've got the angiotensin receptor blockers like Erbisartan and Candesartan that actually block the receptor site, leading to dilation of the efferent arterial and a drop in that intraglomerular hypertension. And of course, we can stop theoretically the release of aldosterone because of the ARBs. And together, we're hopeful that we can reduce fibrosis. It's, there's evidence in the heart, not so much so in the kidneys. So if I just move on, so what are we trying to do? We're trying to, we're trying to slow. Um, sorry about this corruption. Um, slow the um, progression to end stage kidney failure. That's meant to be ESRD at the bottom here, uh, rather than on the next line. And um, with treatment, we're hoping that we're going to ameliorate the loss of GFR. So occasionally, we'll see cases where the GFR just stays the same um, afterwards. Okay, um, and. The heart as well, so renin angiotensin aldosterone upregulation doesn't just affect the kidneys, it's a systemic thing, it affects blood vessels, it takes salt, oxidative stress, inflammation, it affects the heart as well. And um, here we are, we, we see these, the effect of these um, agents on the heart muscle leading to left ventricular hypertrophy, which is abnormal cardiac remodeling with fibrosis in there, don't forget that. So with treatment, we're hoping we can actually get rid of the fibrosis. That's, and there is evidence of that with echocardiography in patients with LVH, if you follow them over time. Potassium, uh, just a, a quick bit of um, information about how we manage potassium. You heard that patient was put on Lakelma. So we know that uh, we've, we've got a sweet spot of normokalemia, uh, 3.5 to 5.3, where we're not at risk. If we get um, an ever-increasing potassium level, um, then there's a, an increased risk of mortality. That's what this is showing. But don't forget hypokalemia also is bad for you as well. And certainly when we get to under three, there's a marked increase in gradient of risk. OK, and you can see that uh, some of the worst combinations are when you've got CKD, heart failure and diabetes um, compared to just diabetes, for example, in terms of risk of mortality. So we must control it, try and put it back into the 3.5 to 5.3 range. How do we do that? Well, you heard about the acute patient who came into A&E and he would have had emergency treatment with calcium gluconate to stabilise the myocardial cells um, and then we, we try to put potassium back into the cells with insulin. You've all done that, insulin and dextrose, or you can use salbutamol or a beta agonist. We've got other things at our disposal, not least these new um, binders, okay? So historically, we, we've used calcium risonium for years, but this is quite toxic. It leads to constipation. Some occasional people actually get um, concrete in the bowel. And, and you know, gut necrosis have been has been recognised. So we've got novel uh, potassium binders. One's called Lakelma sodium zirconium cyclosilicate, and another is Pteroma. And um, this Lakelma works a bit quicker than Pteroma. Within three to four hours, you'll get potassium lowering. Pteroma more like eight to twelve hours. But they're both better tolerated than the existing binders. Just a bit of potassium um, uh, physiology for you. And I know you might think this is a bit boring, but um, important. So um, in our bloodstream, we've got four millimoles per litre. Let's just say serum potassium. We've got five litres of blood in the circulation, 20 millimoles of potassium only. In our whole extracellular water, we've got 60 to 70 millimoles. And our intake is 60 millimoles. So to stay in balance, we've got to get rid of 60 every day. Otherwise, we start getting hyperkalemic. Notice that to get rid of it, 90 odd percent goes via the kidneys and only about 10% via the bowel. Okay, that's only six millimoles. Okay, um, 
The other point to mention is that intracellularly within our cells, we've got three and a half thousand millimoles of potassium and sodium in the cells is at a concentration of just five millimoles per litre and potassium at 150. So it's the exact opposite as in the plasma. OK, so remember those facts. So how do these binders work then? Um, if we're only getting rid of six millimoles per day through our gut? Well, there's an interesting thing. That is that each day we put back into our bowel around three to six litres of fluid from the blood space, which has got a concentration of potassium of about 15 millimoles per litre. So that means we're putting in 45 to 90 millimoles per day into the bowel. And the, the binders work upon that. So you can get rid of about 40 millimoles with binders, uh, which is two thirds of a total intake. So if someone's got renal failure, that's why they work. OK, just uh, quickly on, we've heard about dapagliflozin, um, you know, that the SGLT2 inhibitors, how do they work? Again, you might not be too interested in sodium, but I'll try and make it interesting for you. So we put out into our urine 25,000 millimoles of sodium per day. What does that mean? The, you know, chucking figures at you like this. Well, that's a thousand millimoles per hour, right? Let's just think about that. In our blood, we've got five litres at 140 millimoles per litre. That's 700 millimoles. We're chucking into our urine one and a half times our circulating sodium every hour. So if we don't reabsorb 99.9% .9 of that, you know, I'd be giving this talk lying flat on the floor and you would all be hypotensive on the floor. So we have to um, reabsorb it. And where is it reabsorbed? Well, 50% in the proximal tubule, I said that, and 30% in the in the upper, uh, sort of the loop of Henley, and then a bit more elsewhere. But um, the important thing is in the in the proximal tubule, the sodium is um, reabsorbed in combination with glucose. So there's a, we've got the sodium and glucose linked transporter, and that's what SGLT stands for, SGLT2 inhibitor. So we block the sodium and glucose linked transporter, dropping this... Um, this sodium reabsorption here. So it means that we've got sodium and glucose in the urine, uh, it shouldn't be there. And in the, um, in the distal tubule, there's a sensitive cell called the macula densa, spot this, and they lead to constriction of the afferent arteriole, which is the feed into the glomerulus. And that's brought about by a substance called adenosine. So in terms of Combining these actions, we've got the renin angiotensin blockers, so ACE inhibitors and ARBs that dilate the efferent arteriole. And now we've got the SGLT2 inhibitors that constrict the afferent. So together, they reduce this intraglomerular hypertension that is the one of the risk factors for progression. Okay, and that's why they're a benefit. And just not surprisingly, you would expect that um, with use of this drug, combined with an ACE inhibitor, there's a drop in GFR. And we typically expect three or four mils per minute drop in GFR when you introduce these drugs. We're not worried about that. It's accepted. And the, the idea is you get short-term pain for long-term gain of GFR, just stabilization over time due to dropping uh, the intraglomerular hypertension. And it has other uh, benefits too, anti-inflammatory as well. Just very quickly, one or two slides and then we're done. Um, there was this big trial, dapagliflozin, again, sponsored by AstraZeneca. The dapas CKD trial um, looked at 4,500 people with CKD and proteinuria. A third of them were not diabetic. Really important. Two thirds were diabetic. But the effects were the same in both um, cohorts, the non-diabetic. And, di and diabetics. And you can see that there was a 40% reduction in risk of death, declining kidney function and development of end-stage kidney failure. So this is where the evidence comes from. So my last slide before Hannah takes over. So to slow nephropathy, we control blood pressure to 130 or 80. We use renin antitensin blockade as safe showed you. That helps control blood pressure and proteinuria. Weight loss, lifestyle important. We must optimize glycemic management of the diabetics. We've got these special uh, new agents coming in. I've not mentioned the GLP-1 agonists like uh, semaglutide. Um, maybe we can talk at the end. And then cardiovascular risk management is statins, blood pressure control, anemia control we could maybe talk about afterwards, and then weight loss and lifestyle. So thank you very much for that. I'll hand over to this young lady. 
Thanks, Prof Gallagher. Um, so my name is Hannah O'Keefe and I'm going to do a very quick whistle-stop tour of six-day rules and basic management of acute kidney injury. Um, so six-day rules um, apply to lots of the medications that have just been discussed in the management of CPAD by SAFE and Prof Cara, um, but equally are present in a lot of patients with diabetes and heart failure. Um, and essentially, they're medications that affect renal perfusion or may accumulate in the setting of AKI and they're often summarized by SADMANS, so SGLT2 inhibitors, ACE inhibitors, diuretics, metformin, ARBs, NSAIDs, and sulfonylureas. And the infographic here at the bottom of the screen is from Kodigo, and it summarizes the sequence of events that needs to happen in order for these to be applied effectively. So the patient must recognize that they're sick with a dehydration illness, and they're typically advised that if they have diarrhea and vomiting, or they're pyrexic or shivery, that they should. Uh, recognize the medications that they've been advised to withhold and then stop these. And once they recover, that they should resume their normal treatment. So typically, once they're eating and drinking again, normally for 24 to 48 hours, they should resume their usual treatment. The stages of AKI are defined by creatinine and urine output criteria. And as you'll know, we have three stages, with three being the most severe and also representing poorer outcomes for patients overall. There are many risk factors for AKI, and most of these are present um, in hospitalized patients. So risk factors include underlying chronic kidney disease, prior AKI, patients with heart failure, diabetes, liver disease or cancer, patients with multimorbidity, patients with polypharmacy or those on the medications that we've discussed in sick day rules, those with increasing age, people with cognitive impairment or disability who rely on others for their fluid intake and thus are more likely to suffer from dehydration and patients with sepsis. So not surprisingly, AKI is very common in hospitalized patients, occurring in one in five hospital admissions in the UK. The NCE pod AKI report in 2009, which reviewed AKI management in the UK, found that only 50% of AKI care was considered good or meeting the standards. And there was an unacceptable delay in the recognition of AKI in 43% of cases. And we do know that acute kidney injury is associated with increased morbidity, mortality, prolonged hospital admission, and a long-term risk of chronic kidney disease. So this is an earlier study that shows in the UK population the increased mortality in patients with acute kidney injury. So overall in hospital-wide population in the UK, mortality was 23.6%. And this is highest in those with AKI-3 with a mortality of 36%. We do have some local data from Salford, published by some colleagues here in 2019. And this looked at all admissions in the hospital here between 2011 and 2017. And, and they looked at the top eight medical diagnoses and the top eight surgical diagnoses. So on this slide are the top eight medical diagnoses. Um, you'll see overall in that time frame, there were 26,000 patients with these diagnoses. 14.7% uh, of those had any AKI and 2.4% of them had an AKI-3. In the top eight surgical diagnoses, there were 12,000 patients. 12.1% 12 of those had any AKI and 0.7% had an AKI-3. So clearly AKI is common here and it's relevant to everyone in the audience. Um, importantly, the mortality rates are high in these patients, so it does signify the general severity of illness and how unwell these patients are. The overall mortality for patients in those eight diagnostic categories was 5.1%, those with an AKI rose to 27.7%, and those with AKI-3 rose to 42.6%. Similarly, in the surgical eight diagnoses, Overall mortality was 1.9%. Those with any AKI that rose to 13.7%, and those with AKI3 that rose to 29.4%. So, you know, this is bad news for patients, it needs to be recognized early and managed appropriately. So, what should you do? What's the initial evaluation and management for patients with acute kidney injury? So, it's not good enough to see the AKI alert on the EPR and prescribe some fluids or say, we'll repeat the UNEs tomorrow, you need to go and clinically assess the patients because as we said, this is the barometer of how unwell they are. So consider, do they have an evolving infection or sepsis and treat that? 
optimize hemodynamic status initially with fluids and then if they remain hypotensive determine whether they need vasopressors or inotropic support to improve their blood pressure. They should have dynamic fluid assessment and the aim is for euvolemia so not pumping fluids into patients without ongoing volume assessment. Um, it's really useful to establish the baseline so either through the EPO or look at the GM care record or look elsewhere to see what their baseline was. Do they have pre-existing CKD and help to establish the degree of the AKI. They should have medications review. So as, we, as we've discussed earlier, hold the sad man's medications or others that should be held and then review dosing of medications. Um, so things like antibiotics may need to be dose adjusted depending on their degree of their AKI and it would be helpful to involve your pharmacist in this. Um, monitoring should be ongoing. So volume status monitoring, urine output monitoring, and reassessment of u and e's while the AKI is ongoing. All patients with an acute kidney injury should have a urine dipstick. Um, and if there's blood and protein, it may indicate an underlying intrinsic renal cause. All patients with AKI should also have a renal ultrasound within 24 hours to look for obstruction or any hydronephrosis. Um, so this is a summary from the Society of Acute Medicine called Roundup. And it was agreed as the best summary at um, the most recent AKI consensus meeting in the UK. So it essentially summarizes that initial management. So patients should have U and E monitoring while the AKI is ongoing. They should have obstruction ruled out, a urinalysis, consideration of sepsis if they have an elevated news score, assessment of the volume status and management of that, urine output monitoring, and medications reviewed. So when to contact renal. So if you suspect that there's an underlying cause requiring specialist input, such as vasculitis, glomerular disease, interstitial nephritis, um, which may be signified by their systemic symptoms, so vasculitic rash, epistaxis, other signs, or their positive urinalysis with blood and protein, an AKI not responding to treatment or with an unclear cause, stage three AKI, Complications associated with the AKI that are potential indications for renal replacement therapy, which would be fluid overload, hyperkalemia or uremia, and any AKI in a kidney transplant patient or a patient with underlying CKD4 or 5. After the AKI, it's really important to remember to restart the medications they were on. So often if patients go home without a plan for this to be done, they're never recommenced and they lose the renal protective or cardioprotective benefits of these medications. Um, you should inform the GP of the AKI and the degree of it in their discharge summary. You should also inform the patient and make sure that they understand the sick day rules, because if they don't understand those and know which medications they apply to, then that sequence of events which needs to be performed won't happen. Um, they should also have some post-AKI follow-up to ensure that it resolves and whether they're left with a degree of underlying CKD, which needs further management, um, and they'll also be at increased risk for the future AKIs. This is one study which shows the loss of benefit if the RAS was not commenced after hospitalization for AKI. So patients um, still had a similar risk of recurrent AKI, but they had a higher risk of mortality or cardiovascular events if their RAS inhibition was not recommenced. <clears throat> and I'll just leave with this summary slide from the UK Kidney Association, um, highlighting that AKI is a barometer of how unwell the patient is. Um, risk factors include heart failure, diabetes, CKD, older age, frailty and polypharmacy and AKI is associated with poorer outcomes including acute deterioration, increased length of stay, critical care admission, mortality, early readmission and CKD. Um, so I think Prof Caller is going to mention but the dates for the next grand rounds are here. Um, so Monday the 4th of November from Fairfield. People off restarting their pillars of 